I think that's a really good argument, like to propose to Chinese government. I don't know, Missy. So, yeah. So the, the the problem, I think, it's still like people tend not to segregate the questions. It still feels like like, like you're if you're against um, animal use, then you're against um, TCM, is that or at least you're against a an authentic way of TCM practices. Welcome to Animalia, where we cover all things conservation climate justice, and sustainability. Today on Animalia, we are going to be talking about traditional Chinese medicine, often referred to as TCM. So what is TCM, and why the heck are we talking about it here on Animalia? Let's answer that in reverse order. TCM involves the use of animal products, in particular wildlife products, that spur a lot of the demand for some of the poaching in the world, such as pangolin scales or donkey skin. And while the majority of TCM uses only plants and herbs, and it's just a small portion of TCM that does use these animal products, that small portion really adds up. Because in China, TCM is expected to be a $115 billion market by 2025. Over a third of Chinese citizens practice TCM, And it's now practiced in over 180 countries worldwide. In fact, we practice TCM here in the United States. And I bet each and every one of you has as well. One form is acupuncture. But the more common application is with the common cold. Have you ever nixed antibiotics and opted for rest and hydration instead? In a way, that mirrors a TCM approach, which focuses more on the energy of the body being off balance and holistic ways to solve that. However, TCM also comes in the form of topical ailments, elixirs, and other physical products. And when those products are using wildlife parts, that is where the controversy starts to settle in. As China continues to grow its global presence, its culture will also continue to spread across the world. And growing TCM as a pillar of that culture is a big priority for President Xi. He has spoken out about it many times. So, Just how vital are animal products to TCM? And is it possible to see a future animal-free version of TCM adopted in China and globally? To discuss this, we sat down with a Chinese woman named Xi. Now, while she prefers to remain anonymous due to the sensitive nature of traditional Chinese medicine in the topic, we can tell you that she is a scientific researcher with a focus on studying how TCM products are manufactured, and what its global expansion could look like. So she's definitely the right woman to talk to. She was also born into a family, as she'll discuss with us, that practiced TCM regularly. We are thankful for her time, as we felt it was critical to talk about this topic with someone with deep knowledge as a researcher and practitioner, not just another media source. All right, well, let's get into it and meet Wei. All right, well, thanks for joining us today and making the time. And for, for context... This is a topic that we have touched on in other episodes of Animalia, especially talking about the world of wildlife and wildlife trafficking. But I think with traditional Chinese medicine, most people don't really understand it because it's not practiced as widely here. People don't even realize that it is practiced here in a sense of, I I think of acupuncture, right? As a form of of TCM or inspired by it. I don't know how, how accurate that is. And in the traditional sense of TCM. I also think of just the fact that when I get the common cold, I don't go to a doctor and get antibiotics. I hydrate, I rest. That also feels more similar to a TCM-like solution than a Western medicine. So maybe just to to start for all listeners that predominantly are in the US or or in Western countries and maybe don't know TCM from what they hear, otherwise what they hear from the headlines. And again, we're talking about traditional Chinese medicine. Can you explain the what TCM is, the sort of the high concept of the body's chi and the meridians and just the philosophy of it, as well as then helping us understand how widespread it is in China? Yeah, this is a huge question. I guess I will start from your description here because you said um, when you got a cold, you might just um, hydrate and have some good rest. And you think that is similar to what we consider as traditional Chinese medical practices, uh, which I think is um, very much true, very much correct. 
because I think the the major different thing、um, between TCM and between modern Western medicine is that we have like different systematic knowledges to diagnose and also to treat. So the famous and the most fundamental、uh, diagnosis of traditional Chinese medicine is, which is something like eight principles. So you have like four、um, sets of ideas on、um, you know yin and yang, on、um, biao and li, and all kinds of this、uh, contrasting kind of ideas to identify the symptoms, the symptoms、um, of one's disease of one's body,、um, and then you have、um, according. Accordingly, treat the、um, patient. So this is a different idea of a Western kind of、um, medical practices based on the very precise, the open up of the body, on、um, you know to identify the、um, precise、um, physical location of your you know of your liver, of your heart, of your everything. And then I think I think the maybe put, to put it simply, I think the Western medicine more treat. Human bodies as a machine, as a mechanical beings, that it is important to identify and to see the the problems there. But Chinese Chinese kind of understanding of the body is different from that. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, no, that makes sense, and I think that it segues into another question I have a little bit is sometimes when I think of TCM, I think of it as a spiritual thing. As much as a as a science thing, and when I think of spirituality, I I think of religion too, in the sense that religion relies on a sort of non necessarily measurable, scientifically measurable ideas that give us faith, that get us through things, and and can also cure people of certain ailments because a lot is controlled by the mind, right? A lot of our or even body's health is dictated. By the mind, I think more than people realize, and so if you're in the right mindset of certain things, like you can you can get through things in in different ways. Is it fair to think of TCM as like somewhere in between religion and sort of medical science? Like it's it seems to me like it's borrowing a little bit from each and kind of sitting in the middle. Is that a fair way to say it, or would that not be accurate? Well, it's not wrong. It's definitely not wrong. But I guess the way I see it is slightly different because, okay, maybe I will like start from telling the、uh, naming of traditional Chinese medicine. It's a very new name, actually. So the naming of TCM is super recent, and it actually kind of signifies、um, not just the thing, but the whole social processes、um, in modern China. So it was not called. It, it was definitely not called traditional Chinese medicine before it confronts、um, Western medicine. So there first there's this like confrontation with a totally different knowledge. Then it became necessary to you know name TCM like TCM. So it has to to、um, see there because of the confrontation of、um, the so-called Western medicine now, the, the modern medicine that was happening、um, in early nineteenth centuries. And during that time, you know,、um, Chinese medicine TCM was not originally、um, at the weak side. Actually,、um, actually, that was during that time.、Um, Western medicine has not been formed as、um, the way it is today as well. And the, the people who kind of transmit Western medicine mostly are missionaries、uh, were missionaries in China, and、um, they were not. They were also like trying to incorporate. Local Chinese knowledge in their medical practices during that time. So, but it was because this like very big plague、um, happened in northern China,、uh, which kind of proved that Western medicine、um, was very successful, especially in public health,、um, because it has this like whole infrastructure, you know, to、um, segregate people and to to foregrounding the importance of clean water, you know, things like that. To kind of prove its、um, efficiency and its usefulness to the Chinese public in that time, and then the modernists in China kind of、um, consider this TCM thing as a kind of backward、um, kind of knowledge. So Western medicine won at that time in、um, early 19th century, and it was only the traditional part of the name was only put on、um, during Mao's、uh, Mao Zedong's period of time when、um, he was trying to. 
bring the uh, origin to trying to link with the um, heritage of the ancestors. And then we have this TCM naming in today's language. And it, and it was actually first appeared in an uh, English journal, I think. So it was not, there was no such thing as TCM in China. So, so you know, from the traditional Chinese medicine's point of view, so it was not like uh, TCM was like, you know, in between was, was, was between spiritual and um, scientific. It was more like this other thing, this, this science, this modern Western medicine kind of um, like challenged it. And so it was forced to kind of to um, affiliate with um, Western modern standards of uh, medical practices that was happening uh, in history during that time. So, but I think you're like definitely right. It does feel that it's kind of like in between because, um, um, because you cannot uh, testify TCM with um, modern scientific standards um, entirely. That would be a failure because they kind of follow different principles, different philosophies. Um, but we also know its usefulness. So sometimes um, chemistry, bio- biology, those modern sciences can prove the um, usefulness of traditional Chinese medicine. So I guess it does have some kind of scientificity. So it, it, it kind of kind of um, meet together at some points. Yeah, but it's not entirely fit in your scientific narratives too. Based on your estimation, I know it's it's impossible to get this number right, but just your guess, what percent of the population in China would you say how divided between uses both practices both TCM and Western medicine, practices TCM only and is sort of anti-Western medicine or practices Western medicine is kind of anti-TCM. Like how should we think of that ratio in China today? So I think most people um, stick with Western medicine and um, only a very, very small percentage of people would against Western medicine. But in most cases, people are more like in between because just like you, like when I got a Code, I will probably have some kind of PCM drinks and just to feel better about it. Um, but if I got like a serious disease, I will probably just go to a, a Western doctor. So I think most people are kind of doing both. Yeah. Got it. But, so most people practice a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not like, yeah, but people would not, um, most people would not depend on traditional Chinese medicine nowadays. And for those that use to practice both, is TCM more commonly used in those kind of, let's say, more mild acute cases such as a cold and less so in chronic illnesses? Or is it kind of used throughout? Or the folks that use both, how do they kind of decide when to use TCM versus Western medicine? Yeah, that's one of the cases people would. So it's, it's very much a medicine of experience. So it's not just a doctor um, identify your system and decide um, what it is you get, but it's also because um, um, research in those kinds of cultures, you kind of know your body yourself. So there's like ailments, people might just tend to use PCM. But there's another common case with, um, for people who have really, really serious use, illnesses, especially cancers, which was um, announced by Western medicine that is not curable. People would turn to TCM. In many cases like that. For you, what was in the, and I know we're not going to go into details of the work you're doing in TCM, but what, what makes TCM interesting for you is, is it, were you raised practicing TCM and it's, it's a core part of your culture and your family's culture? Is it something that you learned about or started practicing slightly old, like later in life as an adult or as a young adult? What, how, where did, where does TCM fit into your life story? Is it, and, and your, your family? Uh, my dad is actually a biochemist, but he studies TCM from the biochemist way. The Nobel Prize winner, Tuyoyo, um, the woman, you know, who found out the treatment for malaria. So she was doing the similar thing, of, like she did, like they kind of identify the efficient chemical constituents from the traditional herbs and then they use scientific ways to testify um, to to find out the uh, most efficient parts of the traditional herbs and then they kind of like convert it to western medicine in that way so yeah so i kind of like grew up in his laboratories 
um, that 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 is there's actually like more about TCM that has been really fascinating for me as well because he says that it's completely on as material as 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 chemical constituents on convoluted gather waiting for him to find out which one is the good one. But I just feel the reason people are practicing and the reason people are also enjoying um, TCM, there's more different kind of experience to, to explore it. And by the way, like what an uh, incredible uh, father to have. <laughs> and um, I'm sure he's very proud too of you kind of picking up some of his work and doing what you're doing. So that's a, it's a cool family story. A majority of TCM is, uh, from what I understand, predominantly just plants and herb-based. And a small minority uses animal products, yet, of course, the animal product usage is what gets a lot of the headlines in a negative way. Do, do, you, do you think TCM sort of gets a bad rap in that association, given, like, I, I don't believe it's the majority of use of TCM? And we'll, we'll get into it in more detail in a second, but just to help me understand, like, what roughly percentage of TCM is truly plants and herb, body pressure, things, these types of things, and, and, and what percentage of the treatments of TCM are actively using animal products? Is there, is there any way to break that down, roughly? There are, like, comparably, I think there are a very um, small portion of TCM actually using animal um, products or animal parts at all. Yeah. But, yeah, actually, oh, that's that's kind of my question for you. I wonder, like, what's the uh, reputation of TCM at your end? Yeah. What's the like? What what's the awareness of it? Yeah, or like the reputations you just put there of using also. For me, I think I'm unique in the sense that I did spend some time in China as an adult, which a lot of Americans have not. Maybe they visited China on a vacation, but it's different living there for a couple of years. So I think of TCM as predominantly plant and herb and and pretty pretty positive. But I recognize absolutely, as someone who works in conservation, the even though it's a small portion that uses animal products, it ends up being a big impact on wildlife because, well, there's just a lot of people in China. And there is, there is a big market today for wildlife trafficking in China. And that's not to say China, like there's, there's markets for wildlife trafficking all over the world. Let's be clear. Like every country, including the United States, has illegal wildlife trafficking going on. But that there is a big impact coming from the TCM industry. And what I've seen recently years in China is I've seen a lot of regulation and progress on pushing back a lot of wildlife usage in for meat and for food consumption. But I see, it seems like there's still a lot of more leniency on TCM. And even for parts that like just fundamentally don't have any sort of medical benefits like pangolin scales, which are just, it's dead skin. It's keratin. Like it, there's just no way to just to like, no way to explain that that has a medical benefit. It, it, you could argue it has a spiritual benefit, but so, so for me, I think of TCM as predominantly plant and herb based, which is why I'm not an anti TCM person, but I do recognize it's big impact on wildlife trafficking. And I, because it also seems to me, and we're getting, sorry for the long answer, but it kind of cuts, it touches on a couple topics I know we want to discuss, because I also recognize that TCM is part of Chinese culture that is being spread across the world, naturally. Like China has become a world power. And, and as all world powers do, this is not unique to China. Every country that has grown to strong economic power has spread its culture throughout the world. That is something it's just human beings do. TCM is being spread in accordance. And so I would love to see a world where the non-animal part of TCM is the one that's being spread and the animal part continues to get smaller. And that's also my bias as a conservationist. So that's a long way of saying like, I, I think it's small in terms of animal product usage, but even, oh, it's small, I still think it's problematic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I definitely agree with you, on, especially on the um, impact that this industry um, has, all kinds of animals, actually. Actually, I'm curious about, like, because I saw from the questions that you consider handling scale as um, completely um, useless, while 
spare bile um, as useful? Like, I wonder, like, um, based on what kind of evidence um, you draw that kind of conclusion? Yeah. Why, like, one certain certain animal parts TCM is useful while the other is not? Well, so it's just that pangolin scales are made of keratin, which similar to rhino horn, similar to our fingernails and our hair. Whereas bear bile does have certain gut bacteria. And I, I can look up the exact, or um, maybe Annalise can look it up while she's, while she's there. There is, a, there is a specific compound in bear bile that actually does have proven medicinal qualities. And that's, that's always like when I, when I talk to a lot of conservationists, we talked to the author of Poached, Rachel Newer, last year, and she acknowledges that too. She says like bear bile is, is one of the trickier ones to deal with because unlike a rhino horn, a tiger bone, where there's, there's no real e- scientific evidence that they have any, any upside for people, bear bile does. Bear bile does have scientific evidence. In, in that in that way, I believe, yeah, she's sitting here in the in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I kind of disagree with that kind of argument because, uh, yeah, first I can see the distinction was drawn by chemical uh, scientific experiments. So yeah, I, I understand there was a lot of research published about like the constituents of pangolin scale, similar to you know, fingernails and something like that, and there is also bare bile there but the interesting bit is here so it, it, it so tcm does not say this like single pangolin scale would um cure this certain one disease directly it's always like a a lot of things like all work together and that that also you know um applies to bare bile it does not but yeah although bare bile um it is, has been proved chemically um, scientifically with this useful medicinal ingredient within it. But it, it can also, not this can also be processed, be made by chemical synthesis um, waste. So, but, but people are still argue, arguing, especially um, some very traditional TCM practitioners are insisting that it has to be the real original bear bile from a real bear that has the best usage uh, for treating this like, diseases. So that, you know, kind of like, get back to the pangolin scale story. Although science has already proved pangolin scale is just like constitute um, similar with fingernails, but people would still say there's something left that Western science um, is not able to prove or is not able to, to, to identify. So that's why they just simply uh, equate um, pangolin scale with fingernail and just simply equate this chemically produced useful chemicals or what is on um, the, the acid uh, with, the bear, with the real bear bile. So there's always this something like left over or something um, actual that was not able to be proved by science or not able to be reproduced by science. That, kind of, that, that is kind of the um, real tricky part. Given, let's take pangolin scales for it, because for those reasons, pangolin scales and bear bile should be talked about slightly differently. But I understand why you're saying there's also some some similarity too in the justification. Let's take pangolin scales. So do you think though that since on a scientific, biological, molecular level, they are like ground up pangolin scales would be this like the same material as if we ground up like thousands of human fingernails that we were all trimmed. Do you think the fact that there is a in in a traditional like super traditionalists say, well, no, there is a another there's another factor of the pangolin that I cannot prove to you that I cannot show any evidence of, but I just have this feeling. It's a whatever it is, spiritual, cultural. Is there a division that's forming within the TCM community of those that want to stop using animal parts and kind of create a new era of TCM? versus those that are holding on to those traditions and believe TCM cannot exist without it? Is there, is there, is there kind of division or sides or is that, is that becoming a polarizing issue at all within the TCM community? Yeah, there are actually are. So majorly there are practitioners proposed to use manufactured um, or like chemically made constituents to, to replace the um, animal parts, but there are also people insist on the 
on kind of originality, the authenticity of real animal parts. And for those latter parts of people, they kind of propose, you know, to to have more like human raised animals for this industry. Yeah. So, yeah. So there are those kind of divisions there. The last point you made, so you said there's those that believe use use of human raised, the captive raised animals. Is that that's still on the side of those that want to still use animal parts? Or are you saying that those that are you saying that there's a line that's being drawn that says, okay, we shouldn't use wild animals, but it's okay if they're raised in captivity? Yeah. So, like, I think most people, as far as I know, are kind of against using white animals. But, but although they kind of all against use on white animals, there are still people on who agree with using captured animals or uh, human raised animals. And is that because they they sort of draw an analogy between that and livestock, food, pigs, things we eat? Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. For that group yeah, of people, so. would they classify pangolins? Pangolins are probably not a great, great example of this because it's really hard to raise pangolins in captivity. They are incredibly fickle animals that do not respond well in that environment. So let's take bears, for example. Let's go back to bear bile. Would they look at bears being raised in these bile farms as similar to livestock? It's just now it's it's ra- it's born into captivity. It's not it's not taken from the wild, and therefore for that group of people again for that argument, it's okay. Would they look at bear bile in that way? I think so, they do. Yeah. What do you think it is about psychological? And this is just a human thing. We all deal with this because, and this comes in the way the way we consume food too, as well. What do you think it is psychologically about humans that, for many of us, millions of us all over the world, are not able to factor in this sort of the sentience and the the needs of an animal? And you know, of course, bears living in these bear bile farms is about as torturous of a life that is humanly impossible. I always say to people, I wouldn't wish my worst human enemy, I wouldn't wish them to have the life that a bear does in a bio farm. It's that bad. What is it about, do you think, human beings that are unable to fact, for many of us, they're unable to factor that moral and ethical sort of factor into that decision-making? Um, I think it's because of, capitalized way of living <laughs> um, that maybe sounds confusing but i think we are too far away from each other if people who used for example um, tcm counting spare bio um i think 99 percent of those people if they actually um, have the chance to actually get contact with one bear there they could just simply not using it and they could maybe propose you know not to to have something replaced with that. Actually, Chinese medicine, like this took um, things of changing and like it's a fluid kind of prescription. It's not like you have to have this one thing and there's nothing to replace, to, to replace it. So, so it's, yeah, so it's not, but, but, but it's actually, I think it's the commodity chain. It's a market that kind of fix on um, pangling scale or bear bio in their in their position in, in, the, in the commodity chain because they're they're like they have like super high value and a lot of people are making a lot of money out of the business and that's also why them suddenly became a really, really big problem um, to animals in contemporary world because I, for example I wouldn't consider for example if if a person and he or she got sick and she maybe um killed his pork or he killed his cow and um, took the bone and to make to use it to make it um, into a, a TCM kind of thing and to have it to cure um, his or her disease. But 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 it only became a huge problem because it's in such large and efficient kind of um, way of manufacturing. It's because yeah. So nowadays, like you know, for long people can have tons of pangolins transported, trafficked um, from Africa um, back to China. It was only made possible in contemporary world. So the scale, it was not a original kind of um, TCM would expect. Yeah, it was only possible. It has only been possible very recently. Yeah, which is a similar thing, a similar reckoning we're dealing with with our food industry as well, right? That the 
the the farm factory production of meat is not only has has gotten to a point where it's just incredibly unethical of what these animals go through, but also it's increasingly risky. I mean, uh, our pandemics primarily come from sickened livestock or or wildlife. And and we're likely going to have more because we we're not acting fast enough to sort of rein this in, and and it's the commercialization of these industries that just sort of is like they're like a locomotion locomotive. It's like hard to get hard to slow down because they're just making more money. And then once you make X dollars, you need to make Y dollars. Once you make Y dollars, you need to make Z dollars, and it just keeps going infinitely. I mean, yeah, you could say consumer demand is part of shutting that down, but it's really hard because as commercialization of animal products, whether it's used in TCM or food becomes wider, it also becomes cheaper. And, and then it's hard to get a lot of people to stop using something and go to a more expensive alternative, be it on food or TCM. So you really need the government. This is where we do need government to step in and start to say, actually, this is not okay. I mean, like we've done it before in the United States, the example we always say is with cigarettes, right? Like the government did step in after it was very clear that, hey, these these things are not good for people and really limited the the way micro cigarettes could be sold and marketed, which which absolutely shrunk their market. And I always wonder if we're gonna if we're gonna get to a, a breaking point on the the use of animal products in, in all areas, if we're gonna do the same. The is it you know to understand where the, the China government stands on this. Is it true that there was a COVID treatment approved last year that does use bare bile? I've saw, I've seen it, I've seen it reported in both Western and Chinese media. But I'm always, I'm always like specific to ask people about these things because it's so hard from a Western media standpoint to know what is being reported about in China is true or not because there's bias, right? And there's a lot of like anti. Chinese sentiment from certain journalists here. And, and it's just hard to know and where we get all our information anymore. It's hard to know where there's bias and where there's misinformation because it's just, it's, it's everywhere, misinformation. You, is it true that there was a COVID treatment that was approved by the Chinese government that used bare bile? Or do you, do you not know if that is true or not? Um, I think it's real. I think there's a conjunction that contains bare bile constitutes in the and do you think there is pressure? Because it seems like President Xi, again, has not cracked down too much on the animal product usage in TCM. He has cracked down on some, some again, some food usage and some wild trafficking. But to to your point, just fully allowing kind of captive kind of usage. And he, and he does seem to be enacting laws to protect some of the wild ecosystems in China. And some of the general, like national, like natural world in China, there seems to be more efforts to do that. I mean, there's certainly a big environmental effort in China to clean up some of the pollution and move towards electric vehicles and and get all fossil fuels. Or that seems to be also moving in the right direction in China. But it, it doesn't. Is it fair to say President Xi, to so far, does not feel that does not think there is a need to crack down on the general animal product usage in TCM because it doesn't seem like he has unless there's stuff that's happened that I've missed. Yeah, I don't think he has. Also, I don't think he, I, I don't know if that's real, but it feels like he does not see the animal parts usage uh, as a problem of TCM here. Um, and also, you know, he's a, a big supporter of TCM actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a big supporter of TCM. And I don't think there is a strong enough tendency of seeing the animal parts usage as a big problem within TCM. So it feels like if you're against the animal usage, then you're against TCM. So that is a very tricky part there too. Yeah. Do you think there's a there's a good argument to be had it said that says if you if China wants to can to have TCM more widely adopted around the world. And it, and to, as we talked about, it already is. It's already here in the United States in different, different forms. It's all over the world. But it does seem like it is a pillar of of China's growth that that the governing party and, and President Xi want to see TCM pushed across the world. They want to see it as a big export. If If that is a desire, do you think there's an argument that says, well, you'll have a better chance, China, of making this more global 
if you actually get rid of animal parts, because in a lot of Western countries, that's increasingly an issue. Even in our food system, it's like in the U.S., it's increasingly getting pushback. Like more and more U.S. citizens are moving to plant-based or cutting out meat in their diet. And it's, it's, it's definitely something that's happening pretty quickly here in the U.K. as well. So do you think China actually has a better chance long term of getting TCM more widely adopted globally if, if it cracks down on animal product usage more aggressively? I think that's a really good argument like to propose to Chinese government. I don't know, Missy. So, yeah, so the, the, the problem, I think it's still like people tend not to segregate the questions. It still feels like, like, like you're, if you're against um, animal usage and you're against um, TCM, is that, or at least you're against a, an authentic way of TCM practices, which, yeah, which actually I want to emphasize again, I completely disagree because I think TCM actually following the philosophy of experiencing and especially it, it, it pays particular um, attention to time and space and the relations between human and this time and space and other beings. So actually ignoring um, the, the, the making of um, TCM, the industry there, is actually against um, TCM kind of philosophy itself. Like so it, it would be fine in Asian times if there is like only this one or two prescription that sometimes use tangling scale and for very um rare occasion it would not be like such a big problem. For example, like if in, in some places in East Africa there is this tangling is even um, part of the local uh, meal, local can consider like ed- edible animals, that is actually not 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 gonna be like such a big problem. It, it's it's a small scale. It's like kind of a, a local way, indigenous way of people getting along with um, other beings, other animals, other long human beings. It's kind of like eating and being eaten in some cases. But 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 it's only become problem that you know the as you just said the um, commodification kind of segregates um, the eater and things being eaten. Um, so the the common chain is so long that people does not know anything at all about the other end. And also the, 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 the commodity, commodification, the, the, the modern technologies make it so easy and so fast um, to fulfill all those like, unreasonable demands and desires. That became the problem. So I think the, the, the real philosophy of TCM actually can be a cure of that because it is always about awareness. It's always about taking care about like, yourself and the, the, the surroundings being aware of the, the temporal spatial relations there. But I think the modern manufacturing, the modern industry of PCM um, lost that part. Yeah, it's an interesting point because, and as a, like, one, of the la- one of the other um, questions I wanted to pose for you is, it seems like TCM is so, so much around being balanced, right? And, and being centered. And that it's, it, aids us in when we're off balance, when our, when, when our energy is off balance, our chi is off balance. And if you take that through this discussion of animal products, well, it is clear, I don't think anyone would argue with this, our, as a human species, our relationship with the natural world and, the, and wildlife and animals is off balance. Like we, we have definitely pushed way beyond the balancing point. And we're seeing the ramifications of that, right? We're in most specifically with pandemics and extreme weather, which both of which are going to continue to happen and continue to cause a lot of pain for people. And they're both derived from our, our, the imbalance of our relationship with the natural world. And I don't just mean animals there. I just mean just the destruction of rainforests, the continued sort of uh, warming of our oceans and, and all these things. If so much of TCM is about that spiritual, that balance with yourself, with your surroundings, it feels to me that it would then you could conclude, okay, well, we have to balance our relationship with the natural world in order to be balanced within ourselves, if that is a real deep philosophy. And then thus we must stop using animal products because we we're not in balance on that on that front. We are way off balance. I mean, how could we ever how could we get back to being balanced people? if we don't actually address that issue. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And also, um, I think that raises another question. I feel uh, a lot of these um, animal 
um, usage, animal product usage, and especially wild animal usage in TCM is not many times for the sake of uh, medicine treatment, but many times for, for, for commodity consumption. There are a lot of like, like alcohol or kind of health products. So it's not like for the sake of like a certain, for treating certain diseases, but kind of for living a better life, but which is also closely connected to identity kind of commodity. And many times relates to uh, the sexuality and also the yeah, like sexual ability, um, um, male sexual ability there. So, 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 it, so it some, many times it feels like it's not a TCM in a narrow sense, but it's more like there are so many commodities, so many markets are using the name of TCM to sell, sell more products, so to sell more commodities there. Do you think it's it's possible to have a, a world like to have TCM without the animal products and that and, and having that that be adopted across China and, and where it's used globally? Do you think that is a possibility or do you think there's too many people that would just say that's not TCM? Like the possibility of um, getting rid of animal usage at all in TCM? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't see that coming myself. It's I don't think it's very uh, likely. Yeah. Yeah, actually, like, yeah, I, so are you saying, like, like, for example, there are also TCM products, like, using animal parts, but they're not, like, what, animal parts? Some, some may be using, like, the bone powder from cow or just, like, livestock. Yeah, I mean, I think in an ideal world that is included just because we know from, from science that the livestock industry is one of the, biggest if not the biggest cause of of emissions from a carbon standpoint well and a methane standpoint with cows but from just a greenhouse gas standpoint it's one of the biggest problematic areas so i think they think that needs to be included because we're recognizing like as we keep heating up this environment we keep heating up this atmosphere we're all going to pay you know okay then let me ask you the like same question like do you think it's possible for um, every human being to get rid of eating meat. Eating meat, is that what you said? So I I yeah. think it's possible with innovation. I don't think it's possible with the current products we have. We actually, last year on the podcast, we had one of the founders of Finless Foods on who is creating cell-based seafood, meaning they're taking stem cells or immortalizing them and then they're basically adhering, diffusing and adhering them in a bioreactor to essentially get to a molecularly sound piece of meat that can be consumed. Uh, they're not too far away from being on the market. And there's other companies doing it for other animals. Actually, the first cell-based meat went on the market officially in Singapore last year for a cell-based chicken nugget. And it's technically chicken, right? It's just no no animal needs to be raised or, or killed. It's created in a bioreactor. So for me on the meat question, that to me is the only way we'll get there because you're not going to get enough people to just be plant-based. But that's how you can have meat on the market without the environmental impact um, and the obviously the moral and ethical impact, negative impact. What feels harder about that than TCM is that with the meat industry, and there's going to be pushback. There's going to be, of course, the whole livestock and fishing industry is going to say this is this is not safe and and this is like you're putting chemicals in your body. They're going to say that, but I think that'll get moved past over time. We We eat chemically modified vegetables already. And that's, that's part of like, if anybody thinks their avocados are not modified, avocados are not as big as they are when you get them at these stores, like they are genetic, they are genetically modified avocados. But what it seems harder on the TCM side is that for the meat industry, it's really about, Hey, does it taste like meat? And does it have the same structure? Can I, can I cook it all the same ways? And does it have the same nutrition value? Those are the big questions that cell-based meats can answer. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. But because TCM is so much about this kind of spiritual quality, this unmeasurable quality, that is like there's no way to refute it because it can't be measured. It feels like it'll be harder for the traditional TCM practitioner to move towards a biogenerated animal part than it is for a on the food industry in a way. Yeah, like thank you for answering the question first, and also I think that is also. Um fantastic answer um, for 
the question you raised yourself about TCM, I think um, it's very likely scientists will find a lot of replacement for the animal parts um, in TCM prescriptions. That is not that difficult. And a lot of things are also happening on the ground. But I may have a different idea about cell-based meat would be accepted easier than cell-based animal parts in TCM um, to the customers, to the people. I mean, people eat meat not just because of the flavor, the, the, the protein. There are, I'm not a, an expert on that, but, but I imagine there are a lot of like, you know, other reasons here as well. While, what about this like steakhouse? Like people, people are eating, especially Americans enjoy eating like steak with blood within it. What, is, what about the pleasure of seeing that blood at all? Or eating something like half raw and half cooked? Like, I think there's a whole other kind of desires that uh, for now, cell-based need does not seem can um, satisfy. So I don't think... Yeah, I mean, I don't know specifically on the the bloody meat one, but I it feels like something that's much more baby boomer generation than Gen Z. I have a feeling the way out of that one is just generational change and aging. I, I, I think if you asked a lot of younger people today, they, even ones that eat meat would not like bloody meat and find that a little bit more taboo than an older generation where that was like kind of a, like a bravado thing to eat. So on that one particularly, I think it's a cultural shift that happens. And look, culture is something that is always changing because it's made up, right? Like we all, we all just make up culture. We always have from the beginning, we tell stories about our our gods and goddesses. We tell stories about what happens when we die. And we tell stories about the, the world around us. And, and culture is something that is that is that is manufactured by people. It's incredibly strong and it lasts for long periods of time, but it does change and it can change for the simple reason that it is manufactured. And I believe that it's more of a cultural change on that front that has to happen in order to alleviate that than, than a technology change. A technology change will get us to the, 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 the protein, to the texture, what I mean, to the usability. But you're right, a technology change is not going to get us out of the people who like bloody meat steakhouses. I, I'm saying that kind of jokingly because I'm so far from that person. I don't know anybody like that. So I have to just kind of imagine people like that. But I think to get out of that, it's a cultural change. And and that is not going to happen overnight. But I do think it, it can happen. And, and I see signs of it that it is happening. Yeah. I don't know. Like I agree with the technological change part, which made uh, the change of meat industry and TCM industry possible together. I guess I'm just not as positive about the culture change part. Yeah, culture is hard to change because it's something people hold on to. But we do know it does change, right? I mean, it, it's changed throughout history. I mean, it used to be, it used to be culture, and it's it's horrible, and it's it's and it's tragic, and it's it makes us sad as Americans to say this. But it used to be culture in this country to own a slave. And there was a time in this country when if you spoke up against that, someone said, oh, this is just culture. This is the way it is. But we know now that was horrible, that it was never appropriate, and that an entire community and race of people, Black people in this country, have suffered for 400 years because of it. And they still suffer today because of it. Like Those, those, those cultural impacts of slavery are still woven through our prison systems, our policing systems, and we're finally starting enough people. I mean, a lot of people have been speaking about it for a long time, but now more people are, thankfully. But my, my point being, there was a time where culturally that was just normal and that was acceptable. And But we have changed that. And I think, so that gives me confidence that the culture can change. Whether we'll change on this front, I don't know. I believe it's possible and and I think there's momentum for it, but it, it's too too early to tell. Yeah, I agree with you that on that um, culture can change. Um, but one thing I guess I slightly disagree is like your separation between science and culture, <laughs> like uh, through the time, <laughs> because like as we could see from the TCM story, TCM was not a culture back then. It was, it does not. It was not seen as a culture. It became culture. Because it became alternative 
it became like kind of like pushed um away from the so the, the main the mainstream culture of science. So yeah, so I feel yeah, I guess there's like not a super big division for me to see culture and science uh, separated. Too. Yeah, well, no, I think I think there's a lot of fusion between culture and science. And and sometimes one leads the other, right? Sometimes culture leads what we pursue scientifically. And I think you saw that with like the space programs in the in the 50s and 60s in the in the US and Russia. It was the culture of the the countries wanting to show their world dominance that led them to scientific exploration of outer space. And sometimes science leads culture. Sometimes there's a scientific discovery and and reveal that fundamentally changes the way people think about something. And so I think they both can lead each other. And there's examples on, on both sides of that. Yeah. Yeah, I never agree they can both lead each other. And also, there are also like multiple versions of sciences. I don't know if you agree. Like, it's very positive. There is this science of producing cell-based meat and proving that the equivalence between the cell-based meat is the um, real animal meat there. And but there are also science or at least technologies that facilitate assist the uh, meat industry um, to, to somehow like better kind of raising, killing, and um, producing animal meats there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, yeah, like, I'm not, like, um, I'm not disagreeing with, like, there's a um, possibility of the culture and the science related um, being changed. But I guess I just see them as, like, all together. In yeah. A way. No, these are super complicated issues. And I think we also have to recognize that culture is hard for people, it's hard to change. And culture is meaningful people. Culture gives people meaning and purpose. So I also catch myself when I come across someone who maybe doesn't think the same way I do about animals. It doesn't mean that's a bad person. It just means like they were raised with certain understandings that may have been different than mine. They have different information and they have a culture that like that is part of their life. And you can't just rip someone's culture out from underneath them because that can leave them very isolated, very in a, in a very vulnerable state. Culture gives us community, gives us a sense of belonging. and and we need those. We need that as social people. So these things have to be chipped away over time, is my point. is like We can't just expect overnight changes to these things. And with TCM and animal parts, like I think it would be unfair to expect that to just end right away. But I think the hope for, for me as a, as a obviously animal lover, natural world lover, and conservationist is that over time, and that could be five to 100 years, that we chip away at weeding some of that out. And, and changing that culture slowly where we don't rip it away from people, but we allow it to adapt at an acceptable rate that people can are comfortable with. And that's usually generation by generation. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Like, yeah, do, you right. consider, <laughs> do you consider yourself like as being a member of... Do I consider myself being a member of a certain culture in the United States or just as a person? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think... My move into into kind of climate action and being an environmentalist is is relatively new in terms of my life. I mean, it's only four or five years old in earnest. I spent the first 34 years of my life not caring about much except myself and making money. And I would say myself. I mean, I was always a very generous person. I always, I've always done a lot of volunteer work and I put a lot of other people ahead of me, which to my detriment sometimes, but I never, I never, I was primarily trying to just work the ladder and accumulate wealth and could caught up in that rat race a little bit. And I don't think I had a culture because at the same time, I didn't really identify with those that were wealthy and elite because I didn't really, wasn't really raised that way. So I think I was like kind of aimlessly wandering which then led me to not always being the best version of myself or getting stressed easy or having a lot of anxiety or being triggered easily or getting angry or frustrated or just, yeah, just not, not being the best version of myself. And I think in the last few years, finding my cultural identity with kind of the environmental movement 
finding my tribe, so to speak, and feeling so connected to it and so connected to this planet and having a, such a love of, of animals and wildlife and the, and the natural world for my whole life and finally feeling like I'm now fighting for them versus just sitting by why they get decimated and I don't do anything about it. That has like given me a newfound sense of purpose and it's a, it's a cultural identity for me now that I didn't have but just a few years ago. And that's how quick my like culture for somebody can change. So I think that is part of my culture. I also identify as an Italian and I have an Italian heritage and from a food standpoint and things like that, there's, there's, there's that culture for me. Yeah. And and those are, I think probably more progressive, what we coined as liberal social values. Although I don't like so much the liberal party from a, just a politics standpoint. And and I don't really like either party. So I kind of just stay in the middle, but I'm very liberal socially by, by those, those, those definitions. And that's, I would be another part of my culture. Yeah. Yeah. I think I really like the answer. And also I feel, I agree with you. Like, I feel always like when we identify with some kind of culture, it's always meaningful to, to say about what this or that culture values here. So yeah, also it feels like for you, and also I feel even when you say you don't have a culture, you didn't have a culture previously, obviously you still had a culture, you know, this American kind of progressive kind of culture that, yeah, like, you know, I think, I think valuing wealth is also a culture in a sense, although it seems like cultureless because nowadays most people do. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so I guess my point was just to say, I kind of like against to, 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 to consider TCM as a culture. I mean, it's a culture, but as we just discussed, I think all kind of communities kind of has culture in that sense, like um, value different things. So yeah, just, just to get back a little bit um, to the topic. So there is this like super traditional, traditional list of TCM practitioners that we very much uh, insist on those particular authentic, like, TCM prescription saying like we have to use um, animal parts, especially white animal parts in this or in that, because they considering the old is the best, things like that. They valuing the 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 Asian prescription, let's see, like the national gem 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 in a sense. But yeah, like like for me, like and also I think a lot of uh, TCM practitioners agree with me is that the most valuable thing of TCM is not about like insisting on using a certain kind of animal parts to to make your patients better, but it's more about the awareness of of the surroundings, of the relations, of the connections between oneself and um, the other. The other can be people, can be places, and can be animals there. Yeah, so I guess what is meaningful, what is important for me is like to propose this, this understanding of the culture, of the value of TCM. That's a good point. I think, I think, yeah, I think sort of unpacking it in that way is helpful for me and helpful for people to to know more about it. And I think this this type of conversation is really valuable too. One of my biggest worries is politically is that there ends up being a kind of such a big divide between the U.S. and China in a way that doesn't allow us to learn from each other and grow better through conversations across cultures because of lack of trust. And 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 that lack of trust is really stemming from just political propaganda because like I always tell people my time in China, I mean, people were amazing. Like some of my best friends I've ever ma- made are are Chinese and I never felt unwelcome there. I never felt um, like an outsider. I mean, I felt like an outsider because I look like an outsider, <laughs> but I never felt unwelcome. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get to experience that. And then we have this problem in this country where there's a lot of a big movement of people that are worried about China, just and frankly, because of China's power. And then and that results in a breakdown of communication and a lack of the ability to have conversations like you and I are having. And I think it's just so important that we respect each other. We have open minds and 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 talk through these things because that's the only way we can grow together, right? I mean, even in this conversation, I've grown a lot of my understanding of of TCM, and hopefully you've grown a little bit in the understanding of why some maybe some Western 
kind of conservation oriented folks, the kind of questions they have, but you also probably clearly understand that I'm not against TCM. And I also understand you're not against saving animals, right? So it's just being able to find, have these conversations and find those opportunities to, to, to kind of learn, learn from each other, I think are really important. Yeah, that was very nice. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, like your experience in China um, kind of connected you with the possibility of understanding um, China and TCM. And also, I think the important thing is to connect the practitioners, the users, the users with the animals in a way. Because, yeah, because I think it's a gap, it's a distance that makes people able to avoid um, the harm and the troubles. Um, at the other end of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I'm unique. I know in my, in my, I'm very lucky and privileged to have so many animal experiences in, in the wild and with such a variety of species in my life that I, I can, I can, I can see the, the spiritual quality and the, the consciousness and the emotional and social intelligence of all of these animals down to the honeybee for context. I'm a, I'm a beekeeper as well. And I'm very lucky to have those experiences and it changes my perspective, of course. And I know most people don't have that. So it's not fair to expect them to be the same place I am if you haven't experienced it. And so, yeah, that's also part of why we do this podcast, to share those experiences and to share that perspective. And and I hope more people can experience the natural world because I think that, I think getting into the natural world and spending time in it is really when you start to shift your mindset and you can see the the beauty of it and the the pageantry of it and the and the value of it in a different way than just reading it in a paper and I mean things like that. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree. Well, Way, we got through the questions and I, I appreciate the time and appreciate the open discussion. It's super valuable. I think a lot of our listeners are gonna are gonna learn a lot from this chat and hopefully get encouraged to do their own research on TCM and not just kind of hear what they I don't know, see on a headline on Twitter. Unfortunately, most people just consume information on Twitter now and don't read anything past 180 characters. But but yeah, podcasts can can help in that. So yeah, thanks thanks for the time and we'd love to to stay in touch and and absolutely good luck in, in the work you're doing and and your and your studies and everything and and I really appreciate you you joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.